I have to say I feel very honoured being amongst all these eminent speakers here today. I'm just a mere clinician, so I hope that the information that I'm giving today is of some use. So I've been asked to look at the clinical manifestations of friction-related damage. And as we've just heard, really, friction is somewhat of a drag. And it's particularly a drag for our patients because the long-term potential complications of friction and shear injury, of course, can result in tissue damage, which can be ongoing, can be long-lasting, and eventually could have quite some devastating effects. And that can range, that tissue damage, what we see as clinicians, from something as simple as a red, perhaps boggy feeling heel, to some superficial skin loss, might appear superficial, but actually can be extremely, exquisitely painful for our patients. And of course, much deeper tissue injuries. I think the concept, or, or the, the belief has always been, uh, from a clinician perspective, that friction injury is a very superficial injury. But as we've just heard from Amit, actually it's the deeper tissues that are also being compromised as a result of these shear and friction injuries. I'm fairly confident that most of us at some point have bought that pair of shoes that has been too tight, had nasty old blisters, so we know just how painful these type of injuries can be. And I sometimes wonder why we don't give more credence to uh, the interventions that we have at our fingertips in the ward situation, in the home situation, to prevent what appear to be very superficial injuries on things like heels and bottoms, because our patients may not be able to move off of them themselves. And I can't even begin to imagine what it must feel like lying in a bed, not being able to move with an injury like this. So as clinicians, what we need to try and achieve is to ensure that our patients have comfort, to ensure that we maintain the skin integrity and wherever possible to prevent harm to the tissues. And we can do that by ensuring that we get good positioning in the first instance. If we can ensure that our patients are nice and comfortable to start with, they're very much more likely to not need to wriggle around in the bed, to shift around, and then to perhaps cause some tissue damage through friction and shear. We need to ensure careful repositioning, so ensure that we um, use the equipment that's our, that we have at our disposal to carefully reposition and to prevent injury to the skin. And we can employ the use of specialist equipment and in particular things such as the low friction material equipment. We can in use, uh, use beds that profile we can use slide sheets to help reduce friction as we move our patients in the bed and between the bed and the trolley. And we can use specific pieces of equipment such as the undergarments and the booties made of the low friction material. I haven't put a picture up here, but also of course the dressings is another intervention that people are finding very useful to reduce these type of injuries now. It's important though that if we are using these pieces of equipment that we use them properly. So, for example, with the profiling beds, to ensure that we raise the knee break first so that when we raise the head of the bed, the patient doesn't go sliding down the bed, all those friction forces and shear forces against the bottom and against the heels. If we're using slide sheets to make sure that they're the correct size for the patient so that the whole body is being protected and not just one area. To ensure things such as correct seating, if we plonk our lovely cushions, our pressure-reducing cushions on top of a chair, the patient may feel very unstable in that chair and they will wriggle around and move themselves into a more comfortable and stable position. So if we get the positioning right in the first place, we're less likely to induce these injuries. And ensuring that the patient is comfortable before we walk away from them. We also need to ensure that we're checking back on our patients on a regular basis. And a lot of places now are employing things such as the comfort rounds and the skin bundles. But once again, it's using those to their best effect. 
one of the things that I see, because I do a lot of review of, of clinical notes and clinical records, is that with the skin bundles and with the repositioning charts and the comfort rounds, we're seeing the same position for the patient at every single round. So the staff may be filling these in every two hours, but they're not actually necessarily using the information that's on that chart to inform what they're going to do next. So the patient is always sitting, 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 sitting at every two hour interval that the nurse is going to them, but they're not changing their position. It's always helpful if we can understand our patient's conditions and how that might impact on things such as shear and friction. So for example, the patient with, part with severe Parkinson's disease, with tremors, where we've got constant friction going on between the surface and the skin. Brain injuries, where the patient may have higher ag agitation levels. Dementia or stroke patients that may have repetitive movements such as uh, Jacksonian seizures. The spinal injured patients who are self-transferring, are they catching when they transfer between the bed and the wheelchair? Are they catching on the wheel of the wheelchair? Are they using slide boards? Are they utilizing those slide boards appropriately? Or are they causing friction as they do so? And one of the things as nurses I find we're very good at is ignoring the mobile patient. So the mobile patient who's self-caring, we've done our risk assessment, they're not at particular risk of pressure injury, we let them get on with it. But these mobile patients are just as much, sometimes even more at risk of friction injury because nobody is checking. The patient that pushes themselves up the bed to make themselves more comfortable, digging in that heel, causing friction and shear forces. So just because a patient is mobile, just because a patient is independent, just because a patient is going out and washing themselves and dressing themselves independent, independently, we still need to go back as clinicians and ensure that we check their skin regularly. The European Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel and the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel guidelines, of course, tell us that we should be considering the contribution that shear and friction forces have in the development of pressure ulceration. And they also recommend that we consider the use of silk-like fabrics rather than cotton and polycotton fabrics to reduce the shear and friction damage. So the parafrictor material, as we've just seen from Amit's um, presentation, is designed to reduce friction and shear stress associated with patient movement. It has this very low friction coefficient of about 2 point, uh, sorry, 0 0.2, which in comparison to other materials typically range from between 0.3 and 0.7. And it also reduce, reduces this concept of stiction. And stiction is the additional force that is required to overcome skin sticking to surface before the sliding. Some years ago, and it was some years ago now, it was 2008, 2009, my colleagues and myself took um, a very small sample of patients in, resident, in residential homes and nursing homes, and we looked at whether or not this low friction material could be a useful tool for staff, uh, and cost-effective tool for staff in these care homes to use to help to reduce shear and friction injury in their patients. Now, we did look at the undergarments as well, but I want to focus particularly on the heels. And what we did was we found residents who had redness to their heels, who had bogginess to their heels, and we wanted ones that had this problem with both of their heels so that we could use them as their own control. So we, I think we identified 18 patients, and we gave each of them the low-friction material booty for the right foot, but we left the other foot exposed so that we could do a comparison between the two. They did have standard treatment. They all had their um, alternating mattresses. They had their profiling bed frames, and they were all on appropriate repositioning regimes. We also employed the use of um, high-frequency ultrasound scanning. Now, with this, we can see 
In the normal skin, we have the epidermis at the top here, underlying with the dermis, and then the subdermal tissues. And you can see from that that the pixels are quite regularly ordered, they're quite close together, and the area shows up as blue. In the edematous tissues, we can see that the pixels are very much further apart, they've migrated, and it's shown up by this reddened area. Now what we found was when we used the parafricta booty on the right heel, over a period of four weeks, we saw an improvement in the edema in the tissues. So we went from this very wide distribution of pixels and reddening on the scans to a migration of the pixels back toward the normal level. And when we compare the control heel that didn't have the booty, we can see over the four-week period that actually there was very little difference in the uh, edema levels within the tissue. But in the treated heel, the pixels came back together, the reddening reduced, and, manif and that manifested on the surface as a much more healthy-looking heel. We translated that information into these graphs. The dark blue line is the healthy tissue. And in the control heel, we can see over the four-week period, from the pink, which was at time zero, through to the yellow at two weeks, and the turquoise at blue, that there was very little change in the distribution of the pixels on the scans. However, in the heel that had the booty, we can see that those distribution lines change and by week four, the turquoise line is almost back to the normal, healthy, dark blue line. So from that, we summarize that actually, use of these low friction booties could help us to reverse the effects of shear and friction. They could leave the tissues, therefore, less vulnerable to the effects of shearing and help to reduce the risk of an evolution toward ulceration. So in summary, I feel that with the right interventions, as nurses, we should be able to avoid a lot of these friction and shear injuries through good positioning, through careful repositioning, and through the use of specialist equipment. Thank you.